Hi, welcome back to Mind Control, where we inspire and motivate you. Hope you enjoy the video. Through all the things I've gone through in my life, I had a lot of downs. How did I keep the faith? It was a couple of reasons. Number one, I know from living that if you quit whatever you're trying to accomplish, if you quit whatever you were trying to accomplish can never happen. There's not even a remote possibility. If you quit, there is no chance of it popping back up again, coming back later. Quitting is guaranteed failure. Now, when you're trying, you're going to fail. But quitting, just stopping, that was the number one thing I understood. And then number two, you have to make sure that your dreams, your aspirations and goals are so big that not accomplishing them is not an option. And then the other layer of it is, you're probably gonna have to have some suffering to get there or some sacrifice to get there. And so once you've embraced and decided that this suffering, this sacrifice you're making is an indicator of progress, it's an indicator of obsession. Suffering and sacrifice and hard work is an indication of progress towards our dreams. The lack of sacrifice, the lack of suffering in our lives, it's removal, it's non-existence, also equates to a non-existence of a great life, a non-existence of a dream happening, a big one anyway. You have to want something so big that it wakes you up in the middle of the night. You have to want something so big that you think about it all the time. You have to want something so big that it drives you to wake up when you don't want to. It keeps you up at night when you've long been sleepy. It makes you show up, do things you wouldn't normally do. It requires extra. If you want to be extraordinary and not ordinary, if you want to be ordinary, live your life. And so embrace the fact that you're going to have to sacrifice and suffer to some extent. Once you've embraced that it's going to happen, it's almost not that bad. It's kind of like those of you that are fit. You've sort of accepted that before you go to the gym and get there, you're going to have to suffer. And we go anyway, it becomes a habit. No one goes into a gym thinking, I'm not going to have to sacrifice or suffer. There'll be no discomfort or no pain. Yet in life, outside of that one area, most of us are worried about suffering. We're afraid of it. it. When we're suffering and sacrificing, we wonder whether it's worth it. We wonder whether we're supposed to. We wonder whether sacrifice or setbacks or suffering is a sign it's not our real dream. Don't we? See, at the gym, you never think, oh, I'm going through some pain and discomfort. This must be a sign I shouldn't be at the gym. You'd never think that. So while it's happening, there's no part of you that says, this isn't right. In fact, the indication of the pain and sacrifice and sweat, don't you feel better at the gym? You're like, wow, I really sacrificed today. I really suffered. So in that area, we all know to the extent we suffer and sacrifice is to the extent we grow. And your body is a metaphor for the rest of your life. But the rest of our life, every time we sweat, every time we sacrifice, every time we suffer, we don't do what we do at the gym. We start saying, well, wait a minute. Maybe I'm not supposed to be doing this. Maybe I'm not cut out. Maybe it's not my destiny. Maybe I just can't do it. It's the most unbelievable, ridiculous conclusion we draw, but it's what everybody does, which is another form of distraction is doubt. Another form of distraction is just doubt. And doubt comes from the suffer. It comes from a loss. It comes from fear. It comes from the sacrifice. And so just remember this. You're supposed to suffer and sacrifice. So let me ask you a question. What are you willing to risk in order to make your dream come true? Nothing ventured, nothing gained. You're gonna take a risk. Maybe it's financial. Maybe it's a risk of time. Maybe it's a risk at your job. Maybe it's a risk of looking bad. Maybe it's a risk of failing, of falling on your face, of going broke, of going through pain, of going through anxiety. What are you willing to risk in order to win? The price you will pay for not making your dream come true is far greater than the one that you will pay to make it come true. You'll pay that one the rest of your life. And so ask yourself what you're willing to risk. What's the price you're willing to pay? Never give up until however long that is, step by step, piece by piece, 
book by book, go for it. Don't miss the chance to grow and resolve that you'll pay the price until you learn, change, grow, become. Then you'll discover some of life's best treasures when you pay that price. Because what most people do when they're trying to chase their dream or their big outcome, the whole time they're negotiating the price in their head. Should I continue to do it? Is it worth it? I don't know if I can continue anymore. It's getting higher and that price is failure. That price is setback. That price is looking back. That price can be financial, literally a physical price. And what happens is if you don't negotiate that price in advance, it's going to steal your focus and energy and become another distraction. One of the great distractions of chasing our dreams is this thing that goes off in our head as we're negotiating the price we're paying. Is it getting too high? Is it too much? And you'll have people in your ear, it's too big a sacrifice. You're going through too much. And you begin to negotiate it in your mind. It distracts all your focus. You can't be executing and negotiating simultaneously. If you're in your head negotiating and negotiating and negotiating, you can't execute. So negotiate it now. Negotiate it with me now. What are you willing to pay for me? When I'm after something big, as long as it's legal, ethical, and moral, I'll sacrifice everything else. But I will not sacrifice anything legal, anything unethical, or anything immoral. But beyond that, I'm gonna get it. And I know that negotiation comes up front. I accept the suffering. I accept the sacrifice. I know the sacrifice is far smaller than the one I'll pay if I don't do it. And I eliminate distractions, and I go freaking get what I want in my life just like you can, and this needs to be your recipe as well. Successful people don't negotiate the cost of something. They negotiate whether it's worth it. What I'm telling you is if you really want something bad enough, it's worth it. It's worth it. So start to feed yourself the worth question over and over and over again, not the cost question. Cost is a distraction. Worth is a focus mechanism. This is so worth it. It's so worth it. It's so worth it. Focuses you. Cost distracts you. And a friend of mine said, you know when people change? And I said, no. He said, when they get to the point and they say, I've had it. I've had it. I can do better than this. He was in the hog pen. He was broke. He had lost everything. He was deranged and deprived and distraught. But the Bible said he came to himself in this deplorable situation. He came to himself. He didn't get any money in the mail. He didn't meet any fine person that built up his self-esteem. This was an inside job. He came to himself, said, wait a minute, I'm better than this. And the moment he made up his mind to get up, he got up. And I want to tell you something today. The moment you make up your mind to get up, you can get up. And no devil in hell, no system, no government, no power, no boss, no community, or anything else can hold you. Once you are free in your mind, you are free. The Bible says it is with the mind that we serve the Lord. This amazing piece of hard drive that God put in between our ears and is so programmable and so impressionable that there is a constant war between good and evil for the code to be able to program your mind. And there's constant war, constant conflict going on as to who gets into your database and who is going to program your mind. Because all that you will do or not do, have or not have, accomplish or not accomplish, will be a direct derivative of what's going on inside of your mind. For it says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Your thinking has all the world to do with where you are. Your attitude has all the world to do with your altitude. So if you don't get clear thinking on an issue, you won't be able to develop in that area. Most and generally, when we talk about that warfare and dealing with the images in our mind, we generally think in terms of sin. But I want to challenge you to understand that you have more to deal with in the warfare in your mind than just sin. You, you have depression, you have fear, you have phobias, you have insecurities, you have unbeliefs. There are a whole lot of dysfunctional uh, behaviors that were inherently passed on to us, but these are the reverberating consequences of an act of sin that leave you struggling in areas that people cannot see. Lay your hand on your head. 
say this is an awesome machine. I wonder if it's being underutilized. That's what makes us different than dogs and animals, and birds, and cats and spiders and alligators. That's what makes us different than all other life forms. The ability to think, the ability to use your mind, the ability to process ideas, and not just operate by instinct. You can order the entire process of your own life. And we do that by the way we think. We do that by exercising our mind. We do that by processing ideas and come up with a better philosophy, a better strategy for our life, goals for the future, plans to achieve those goals. All this comes from developing our philosophy. Think, use your mind, come up with ideas and strengthen your philosophy. That is the major challenge of life. You don't need a better economy. You don't need better seed and soil. In fact, when it comes to seed and soil and rain and sunshine and seasons and the miracle of life, that's all you got. Now, what if you blame this stuff? Then you're blaming all you got. Guess what I had to do at age 25 in order to change my own future? I had to change my mind. I had to change my thinking. I had to change my philosophy. I was messed up on what was causing my problem. Once I got rid of that and started going for where the real problem was, which was me, I'm telling you, my life exploded into change. God may be giving you more to work with than what you are working with at this time. You may have far more megabytes and more things that you can potentially do than what you're doing right now. That's why I don't like to hang with low thinking people because they'll make you underutilize what God has given you. You need somebody to challenge you that you could be doing more than what you're doing right now. You could have more than you have right now. You could go further than you're going right now. And somebody's got to be bold enough to look you in the face and empower you to go into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from you. Look at somebody and say, it's time for a change. What stops us from making the changes that we need in our behavior, in our situation, it's the mind. I understand that there are about a million what they call, what are described as sensory receptors in the brain. Sensory receptors in the brain. That through the brain sensory receptors, we are, we are able to gather and maintain data. About a million sensory receptors in your brain. Huge operation in your brain. I just see it as a big electronic board with all kinds of connections going on in your head whereby you are able to gather and galvanize data about a million receptors, sensory receptors that are constantly gathering information while I'm speaking right now. They're operating right now in your brain, making you able not only to hear what I say, but assess my movements and you're gathering expressed and implied information because you got it like that. You can do two or three things at the same time, four or five, six things at the same time, and gather all of that information all at the same time because your mind is awesome, you're bright, you're brilliant, you are fearfully and marvelously made. You're an awesome computer full of all kinds of information all the time spouting out data, thinking and speaking all at the same time. I'm thinking about one thing and speaking something else all at the same time because we got it like that. Look at somebody say, I'm bad but you have 10 billion sensory receptors that work in your imagination. But those 10 billion sensory receptors that you have make your, your imagination so keen that you have all of these impressions that come through your ability to conjure up information through the invisible realm and it can become more real to you and that's what causes some people to become sick it's when the imagined becomes more real than reality and that's what causes them to have certain dysfunctions that they cause them to be uh, diminished in their thinking i was watching uh, ray charles they were going through ray charles's life and they were talking about ray charles who was blind couldn't see and yet he learned uh, how to compose music and read music by Braille. And he could write music uh, by Braille. So he wasn't just some gifted blind person who could play. He was intelligent. He was intellectual. He was gifted. He was creative. He could, he could read and write and compose music. Even though he couldn't see and he had lost the benefit of one of those devices that bring information to his sensory receptors, he began to rely on his 
invisible the 10 billion sensory receptors to gather information through other channels. Interestingly enough, he said something that, that was so harmonious was my message, I thought I would include it. He said that even though he had gone blind at seven, at five years old, he'd seen his brother drown uh, to death in a small basin of water, and by seven, he'd gone blind, if I remember correctly. And by the time he was 12 or so, uh, both his parents were dead. He was blind, he'd seen a murder, and his life was off and seemingly out of control, and music became an outlet for his spirit and for his soul. And he says, even though he couldn't see, he could hear the imagined music in his head so strongly that when he got ready to compose a piece, he says he didn't need a piano. He could compose an entire piece in his head because the accuracy of the music he heard in his head was more real to him than the music he played with his fingers. So what's going on in your head often can become more real than what's going on in your life. Well, how do we get this information? We get this information through conditioning, through imagination, through suggestions, through implications, and all of this affects who we are and how we function as individuals. Are you following what I'm saying? That's why you have to watch what you do with your eye gate and your ear gate and your mouth gate because all of these are gates to the soul whereby the enemy evil or wickedness or righteousness comes before you. And the images that you have seen have all the world to do with who you are right now. Are you following what I'm saying? We'd like to thank you so much for watching till the end. Don't forget to share your thoughts in the comments section. Please also like, subscribe, and share this video with your friends and families. Please watch our other motivational videos. Thank you again.